a man and his five-year-old son were driving past the cemetery one day. And they noticed a large pile of dirt next to a freshly dug grave. And the little boy said, Look, Dad, one got out. It's a scary thought, isn't it? Especially if you're a little child. But one has gotten out. Never to return to the grave. And that is Jesus Christ. So the next time you drive by a cemetery, think of what that little boy said. Think of the one whom the grave could not hold. In Mark 16, verses 1 through 6, it was the Sabbath. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint the body of Jesus Christ. As they were going to the tomb, they were talking among themselves how they were going to get the, the stone that was in front of the tomb to the entrance of the tomb removed so they could enter in. And in verse 4 it says, And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. In verse 5, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, whom has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. Last week, we looked at the central message of the gospel of Jesus Christ in verses 5 through 8. Jesus died according to the Old Testament scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And he was seen by many witnesses among 500 brethren at one time of whom the majority were still alive when Paul wrote that letter to the church of God at Corinth. And he mentions several witnesses of his Jesus' resurrection. Yet some of the church in Corinth were discussing among themselves that there would not be a resurrection. And verse 12 states that some, not all of them, not all of the church believed in the resurrection of the body. Some did believe. Some did not believe. They were not denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as we've noticed in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 15. The good news about Jesus had been preached to them. The gospel of Jesus. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. They received it. They were standing in it. They were saved by it. And for what Paul says in verses 12 through 19 is meaningless if they do not accept the resurrection of Christ. If they do not accept the resurrection, period. Whose resurrection were they denying then? Their own resurrection. Their own bodily resurrection. If you would notice with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 16. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? NLT says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. Burton Kaufman quotes from Ellicott's commentary on the whole Bible. He says, in other words, if there be no resurrection, the only alternative is atheism. For otherwise, one would have to believe that, though there is a God who is wise and just, yet the purest and greatest life that has ever lived is no better in the end than life of a dog. What is Paul trying to stress? In verses 12 through 19, 
It's this. Since Christ was bodily resurrected, you should not even question your own resurrection. Notice verse 12. Now if Christ be preached that He rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Verse 13. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. What if, what if you guys are trying to say and trying to believe that there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not been resurrected from the dead. The resurrection of the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the resurrection of mankind cannot be separated. They are conjoined together. They are inseparable. They are connected together as you would take super glue. They cannot be separated. If Jesus Christ has been resurrected, we also are going to have a bodily resurrection. Those who pretend to be Christians and deny the resurrection are not Christians at all in the New Testament sense. In this study, I want us to observe verses 12 through 19. The consequences of denying our resurrection. And another way to look at this, we're going to be attacking this and studying this is from the perspective, the relationship between the resurrection to blank. Number one, the relationship between the resurrection and their preaching. The beginning part of verse 14. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. Notice what he says. Notice the consequences of not accepting the resurrection. Our preaching is vain if Christ has not been resurrected. Who's preaching? Without a doubt, he's referring to the gospel that had been proclaimed by the apostles, by men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. But let's not limit it to just these. The same would hold true today if we denied the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In other words, if it was true that Jesus Christ had not been resurrected, we would have no resurrection. And if we have no resurrection, Christ would have not been raised from the dead. So if the church then, or if the church now, Proclaim Jesus did not raise from the grave. The message that they were proclaiming would be in vain. So it is saying something about the message and not the messenger. The message of the gospel is in vain. This is a way of saying that the thing preached is in vain. The preaching the message itself would be empty, powerless, meaningless, useless. It meant nothing whatsoever if Jesus had not been raised. The message focuses on the incarnation, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the second coming of Jesus Christ. You remember what Paul stated in chapter 1, verse 23 of this letter? He says, we preach Christ crucified. In verse 18, he says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And that's why it's foolishness to so many people today to, to preach a crucified Christ. But it says, Unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. Did he not write to the Romans, the Christians in Rome, in chapter 1, verse 16, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, if there was no resurrection of Christ, there would be nothing to preach. There would be no message of salvation. There would be no hope beyond this life. The one preaching would just be blowing smoke, a lot of hot air. It doesn't make sense to serve a dead Savior, does it? Second one. Let's look at the relationship between the resurrection and our faith? Or what is the consequences 
of no resurrection in relationship to our faith. Notice verse 14. If Christ be not risen, he says your faith is also vain. Not only your preaching, but your faith is vain. Look at verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. If the message is in vain, our faith has to be in vain also. Why? Because our faith is based on the message. Our faith is based on fact, not just feeling. If it was based upon feeling, then it was not based upon fact. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 states, Now faith is the substance, the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence or the conviction of things not seen. How can we have that conviction? How can we have that assurance, the Word of God? For you see, we've got to have faith to be pleasing unto God, Hebrews 11, 6, for we must believe that He exists. He is. <coughs> Excuse me. And He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So how can there be faith if God's Word is not truth? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth, John 17, 17. Faith is the belief of testimony. The testimony of these men who wrote the New Testament. These men, and we could say the apostles, who were inspired by the Holy Spirit in this context, were eyewitnesses of the resurrected Lord as well as others. If they bore false witness concerning that resurrection of Jesus Christ, their faith, as well as our faith, is nothing more than the belief of a falsehood. So, if there's no resurrection, our preaching is in vain, and our faith is in vain. That's the consequences of denying the resurrection. Number three. In verse 15, we see the relationship between the resurrection and the messengers. Yea, and if we found, yea, and if, yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead is not raised. How did people believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Through the preaching and the teaching of the man that we read that's recorded in the New Covenant. But if Jesus had not been resurrected, their preaching, their message is empty, and faith is based upon something that is empty, something that is useless. <coughs> J.W. McGarvey said, it was not an issue of truth, or mistake, but of truth or falsehood. The messenger was found to be false witness, a false witness of God. The messengers made it very clear that it was God who raised Jesus from the dead. Look at verse 15. We have testified of God that he raised up Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 2, verse 32, This Jesus God raised up again is what Peter proclaimed, to which we are all witnesses. What does this make them, the ones that are testifying of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that God raised him up from the dead? It's making them to be liars. That's absolute truth. Liars. If there's no resurrection. They claim that God did raise Jesus up from the grave, but if he's not risen, they would not only have been mistaken, but they were falsifiers against God. They were liars. The scriptures affirm they do teach it was the power of God who raised Jesus from the grave. We see this in Acts 2.32. We see this in 1 Corinthians 15.15. 15. In Romans chapter 6, verse 4. 
Well, really, if we go back to verse 3 and verse 4, it says, Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. If Jesus has been resurrected, we are resurrected out of that watery grave of baptism to walk in a new life because we have a new relationship with God. <coughs> Our sins are forgiven. We become that new creation in Christ Jesus. God raised Jesus from the dead. But notice Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Not only God, but the Holy Spirit was involved in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ also. He says, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwells in you. God and the Holy Spirit were involved in raising up the body of Jesus Christ and they are going to be involved in the resurrection of us from the grave. A bodily resurrection. And we'll be talking more about that bodily resurrection in the weeks to come. But the Bible also states, God's Word states, that Jesus Christ Himself raised Himself from the dead. In John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. Remember, he said, no man can take it from me. I'm the one that has the power to lay it down. And notice what else Jesus said. And I have the power to take it again. I have the power to raise it from the dead. To raise it from the grave. This commandment have I received of my Father. That's John 10 verse 17 and 18. So we're just not talking about a historical event. But we're talking about the power and the nature and the promise. As well as the faithfulness of God himself. If there is no resurrection of Jesus Christ, I have no faith in God. Why? Why would I have faith in someone that is not trustworthy if there's no resurrection from the dead? If Jesus had not been resurrected from the grave, I make God out to be a liar. You take a car, for example. How many of us have had a car that has let us down before. It's not trustworthy. Maybe you, you were on your way to somewhere important and the car just dies. Something happens to it. And it happens two or three times after that. What do you do with the car? You lose faith in it, don't you? And you get rid of that car before you take another long trip. If God was not completely honest, 100% trustworthy, 100% dependable, if He lied, we'd lose faith in Him also, wouldn't we? God is truthful. Titus chapter 1 verse 2 says, He never lies. King James Version says that He cannot lie. NAS says, Who cannot lie? Therefore, we can believe, we can trust in His promises because He always tells us the truth. God is faithful. Hebrews 10, verse 23. NAS says, Let's hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For He who promised is faithful. If the Lord ever breaks a promise, our Christian theology falls apart because because he would cease to be who he says he is and what he is. But since God has never failed to keep his word in the past, we can trust him in the present, and we can trust his word in the future. 
He has not told us a lie concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ and our resurrection as the result of Jesus' resurrection. What are the consequences of denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Number one, our preaching is vain. Number two, our faith is in vain. Number three, the messengers are liars. They've made God to be a liar also. Number four, let's look at the relationship between the resurrection and our sins in verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You're yet in your sins. Christ was a masterful teacher. He was a great teacher. But listen to me. Listen to me very carefully. Teaching does not save anyone. Teaching does not atone for anyone's sins. Teaching does not justify one sin, period. Our sins are forgiven based upon the fact of the death of Jesus Christ, the burial of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, our belief of those facts and our obedience to those facts is what saves us. In Romans chapter 4, verse 24 and 25, notice very carefully a purpose for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, talking about the righteousness of imputed unto us. The same righteousness that Abraham received, the same righteousness that David received, as we see in Romans chapter 4. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on Him, God, that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, and was raised again for our justification. A very simple definition for justification that I learned many years ago, just as if I'd never sinned. That's the way God views us. That's why Jesus Christ was resurrected from the grave. It was so God can look at us when we stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ and He looks at us, He does not see our filthy rags of righteousness, but He sees the righteousness of His Son, His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Those who have died in Christ have not perished. Look at verse 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished if there is no resurrection. But there is a resurrection because Jesus has been resurrected. So therefore those who have fallen asleep, those who have already died, have not perished. What's the result of the resurrection? God is truthful. The message is true. Jesus was and Jesus did notice died for our sins buried and raised again on the third day for our justification so that we can have faith in that message the word of God so that we our faith can be pleasing unto him so that we can know that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him we have the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ as the result of His death, His burial, and His resurrection. Those who have already died have not perished, but they are in a saved state. Man's hope, our hope, my hope, your hope, extends beyond this life, beyond the grave. Notice verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, 
we are of all men most miserable. If, if our hope does not go beyond this life that we live here on earth, if it does not go beyond the grave, we are of all men most miserable. The NLT says, and if we have hope in Christ only for this life, we are the most miserable people in the world. If Jesus was not raised from the dead, everything that Christians do, their good works, their struggles against sin, their financial contributions, their mission efforts, and so on, you just name, 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 it's all been a waste of time. Many Christians, including Paul, gave up almost everything in life to be able to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ so they can attain unto the resurrection, so that they can have forgiveness of sins. They even risked their lives, and some of them did die for the name of Jesus Christ. In the early church, Christians lost their families, they lost friends, they lost jobs, they lost their homes, yes, even their lives. So Paul says that Christians would deserve great pity if their hope for resurrection proved to be false. Not only would they receive no benefit from their religion, but they would also forfeit the pleasures of their brief life on earth. Did you know that Mr. Winston Churchill planned, arranged his own funeral? And at the close of the service, he had arranged for a, burglar, a, a bugler to be positioned high up in the dome to play taps. And as you know, this is the universal signal that the day is over. But when that was finished, on the opposite side, another bugler played revelry, the signal of a new day beginning. It's time to get up in the morning. This was Winston Churchill's testimony that at the end of his life, the last note will not be taps, but revelry. When a person dies, he will live again. He will be raised into the resurrection of life, or he will be raised to the resurrection of damnation. It's up to you. Jesus has done all that he can do for you. And that's grace. The rest is up to us. Up to you, and it's up to me. And that is faith. And that is obedience. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins and was buried and was resurrected so that we could have life and have it more abundantly, so that we could be justified, so that we could stand before God and God see Jesus' righteousness that is imputed unto us? Do you believe that? And will I ask you this, have you obeyed the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus? We obey it in baptism, as we see in Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and verse 4. And we're raised with Christ up into that watery grave of baptism to walk in a new life. Do you have that new life today? Are, a, are you a new creature that is in Jesus Christ, a new creation? Do you have a new master, Jesus? Are you his servant? Thank you for listening this evening. This is Billy Robinson with the Prairie Plains Church of Christ.